Hello, and welcome to a fluid form research highlight. I'm Andrew Hudson. To understand why we are doing this YouTube series is a two-part answer. The first serves as a way to give graduate students and postdocs more credit to the contributions to their work for their research outside of the occasional conference or research paper that they get. The second is to provide more details within a paper as to the methods that are crucial for success. I, as a graduate student, occasionally find it frustrating when you go into a method section and there is occasional uh, lack of detail in the methods that really don't help guarantee your success for replication. So by doing this series, we not only try and give more credit to the graduate students who work really hard in these papers, but we try and also have enough detail and emphasis in certain sections of the methods that can't really be highlighted or bolded in the methods section to further increase your chance of successful replication of that paper or that technique. Uh, our guest today is Dr. TJ Hinton, very briefly. TJ got his undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering from Purdue University. He then subsequently went on to Carnegie Mellon University to earn a master's and bachelor, master's and PhD uh, in biomedical engineering with his advisor, Dr. Adam Feinberg. TJ is credited with creating the fresh 3D printing technique, which was first published in 2015 in Science Advances. Today, we will be discussing uh, a paper that he was an author on titled 3D Bioprinting of Collagen to Rebuild Components of the Human Heart was published in Science in August of 2019. Since graduating, TJ has co-founded Fluidform, a startup company that seeks to use the fresh 3D printing technique to 3D print liquids that were previously impossible for applications ranging from biological purposes to high performance materials. Without further ado, here is Dr. TJ Hinton. Um, well, I already gave you an interjection that you didn't see before. Um, but anyway, uh, as Dr. <laughs> TJ Hinton, now uh, co-founder of Fluid Forum and basically head of R&D. Um, so today we're, we're not going to explicitly be talking, talking about the 2015 paper of you developing fresh. This is more of the, your current work in the science paper back in 2019, um, in particular your work on 3D printing the neonatal scale heart model from collagen. Um, so to do that, well, first of all, thank you for, for joining us. Um, but I guess we can, we can start off with just general basic overall questions. Um, can you just describe the, the heart that you printed? Yeah, it's, that heart was a lot like a plastic 3D print in many ways. Um, it was collagen ink, so it was, you know, just a dissolved collagen in an acid, and uh, we added a little barium sulfate for reasons I'm sure we'll get into later. Um, and printed it just like you would print plastic, not out of a hot nozzle, right? But right. still, we have an extruder moving around, laying down ink. And uh, the collagen, by virtue of a little bit of diffusion, fused to itself, and you build up a construct in 3D, and we chose to do a heart. So at the end of the day, what we had was a model of the human heart that had the valves and you know, a small part of the vasculature. Um, but basically all the intact structures that were resolved by the MRI data that we used for it. And if you tore it open, you'd see that there was infill patterns and perimeters and some travel artifacts. And yeah, which is done in the paper too. Huh? Which is, 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 is done in the paper. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, just typical characteristics of a 3D print. So yeah. Um, so it was not, it was not a tissue engineered heart. It was not right. a live beating heart. It was a model made out of a very important hydrogel in tissue engineering. Right, and I think uh, you and I talk about this pretty frequently is the, the frustrations of the nitty gritty of a paper versus what gets distilled into a one or two sentence headline where you printed a heart model, the word model gets left out and it's now just a heart. Um, and that carries with it a lot more implications that kind of help this gap between public expectation and what really happened. Um, right. And I think something that we really try and do with this series is, is to actually let these things get aired out in, in a longer format. Um, this is why I think podcasting is becoming really popular because people do just kind of want to sit around for however long it takes to actually get the information to them, be it 45 minutes or three hours. And so these podcasts are actually gaining in popularity. So hopefully, um, people who are really interested in bioprinting, um, who are really interested in fresh, um, will just watch this in general at whatever pace that they want to skip around uh, and really learn more about what goes into this type of printing, this type of paper, 
Um, so aside from just doing the the heart, what what led to the heart? Why not a skull or any other thing? Well, first and foremost, I was in the Feinberg lab, and the Feinberg lab is a heart tissue engineering lab for the most part. Um, we needed an example of a large, complete 3D print, kind of the equivalent of a plastic trinket that you would come, you know, get out of a desktop 3D printer. And it seemed perfect to choose the heart. It's got a lot of unusual structures compared to most other organs in the body. You could say that the lungs, the liver, the you know, various different organs are going to have kind of a, a relatively simple hierarchical structure, whereas the heart has all these subdivisions that each have different hierarchies within them. And it's great because it's physical, you know. We're not at the cellular level describing these structures. I'm talking about things that are microscopic like valves right. and lobes of muscle and chambers and distinct regions of vasculature. Like we can all point to you know, coronary arteries and be like, that's what causes a heart attack. And they're all visible in MRI data. So we knew there was an open data set out there that we could access and we knew that it had a particularly good uh, set of pieces of the heart. So we decided to go for that and um, yeah, kind of everything came together and uh, everybody, everybody likes the heart um, for a lot of reasons just yeah. because it's so critical to life. But um, we internally liked the heart because it's complicated. It's a challenging print, even if you do it in plastic or powder or whatever you choose. Right. And we were trying to demo the capabilities of fresh printing just by choosing a difficult print. Right, and you, and you mentioned uh, getting a lot of the, the detail from the MRI data. Um, what we can go into later, it's not specifically just on the, on the heart portion, um, but was trying to actually fill in those gaps because as we try and highlight, MRI can only go so far down in length scale. And anything below some of the larger coronary arteries we really can't get. So it, it, any, any time later on we can go and we can talk about another portion, because it, it was something that you had a major contribution to, um, was kind of computationally filling in the gaps of what MRI can get and what we can actually start generating um, subsequently after we get some MRI data. Um, but you, you kind of alluded to this before, which is um, how many people or how much effort had to go into getting this heart? Was it, it, it wasn't just you, I mean, I, I was on this paper with you, um, but I wasn't the only one uh, working on it, obviously. So how many people did it take to actually go from idea to the picture that you see in the paper? I'd say you can include quite a few of the authors. Um, you. Uh, made the uh, support slurry for Fresh, and uh, I think you're aware of that, because um, you're kind of the king of that stuff. Um, but it, I was responsible for the printing, the Fresh printing and the release that comes at the end of the Fresh printing process. And then there were a couple of other steps that followed. Um, Josh, uh, Josh Tashman and Dan Shorsky both kind of collaborated to take these absolutely stunning photos of that print, actually a couple of prints. Um, and for that to happen, they had to have, basically these two guys are very much into photography, so they figured out a way to get the heart, which is very soft and fragile, into a big glass dish, like a three liter glass pan, and then surround it in, like, black velvet and then take these really amazing almost macro style uh, shots of it and then once they had finished taking these wonderful photos it then went to Sai, Sai uh, your nanny and he was responsible I mean I kind of worked with him on this but basically we figured out a way to get the heart into a container stuck in agarose gel and then put it into a CT scanner. And that's why we had the barium sulfate in the collagen ink, was so that the print would be radio opaque, and so that we could then scan it in a CT scanner and show that the internal structures that you can't see because the walls of the print are opaque are there. Right. 
And yeah, the, the tricky part there with the Agaros was just that it's such a soft print, getting it embedded. I'm sure anybody who's done histology has run into challenges like this, but getting a soft object embedded in a gel can be kind of challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, I'd say overall, there were a good five people solidly involved in this. Yeah, I think Benny, for most research papers, it's actually pretty in entwined, intertwined how yeah. uh, how many people have to go into just making one figure. Um, but I think something uh, that a lot of people kind of wonder about is how do you really try and take some of these images of these things? And, and you kind of alluded to it earlier, and this is something that I think people really admire about the work of like the, the Lewis Lab at Harvard, where they're able to take these really stunning images. And a lot of what is really important about your paper uh, being easy to read and easy to convey is how clear the images are, both the ones that you make digitally and the ones that you take physically. Um, and something that I think you, you, you were touching upon was that to do all this imaging, it really helps to have someone in your lab who likes photography. <laughs> uh, we have two, so we're very lucky. <laughs> yeah. um, but then the recommendations you mentioned, you were talking about like black velvet, which we agree really, really helps uh, be as dark of a background as possible. It's not some, some Vanta black or anything, um, but that really helps reduce any background noise. And then the second, probably most important thing would just be the lighting and experimenting with lighting, yeah. um, taking it into a relatively dark room and then only having say like gooseneck lamps that you can then uh, position either obliquely or vertically or both if you have multiple ones. Um, but yeah, I think you, you and I would agree that uh, experimenting with either a night with a nice DSLR camera, different lenses, a macro lens, a probe lens, having the right setup like a uh, photography box that you can buy on Amazon is, yep. is immensely helpful for making your stuff just look a little bit cleaner. Um, and it's it goes further than that, you know? It it teaches you a lot about the prints. If mm -hmm. you you know, these are gels, right? These prints that we're making. And so it can be kind of hard to see them. And short of using fluorescence microscopy with dyes or just mm -hmm. multi-photon um, effects, like you really have to rely on visual cues to tell you how these prints are turning out. And I think that, yeah, it's great to have photography nerds, but a cell phone with oblique lighting can take a really nice picture. Yeah. Uh, something kind of like dark field lighting, right? On, yeah. a, on a dark field microscope. It, that makes a huge difference, um, yeah, especially with these collagen prints because they scatter light so well being bright white. They look like decellularized organs. Yeah. And in terms of the actual hardware that gets used in this paper, I think something that really is kind of hard to sell very strongly with just the methods where you just say this was done basically on a flash forge, or I think I, I was also using a printer bought simple metal at the time. Um, Number one is, can you talk about like the cost of those printers and why we had to make or modify them? Yeah, so um, we had a long history with modifying 3D printers and the, there's a good reason behind that. It's because back when we started, there weren't bio printers that really did a lot. Um, we bought a MakerBot a replicator and modified it way back in the day and we kind of kept that thing going forward and the reason for that is because we found out very quickly that uh, mechanical syringe pump extruders not the air pressure driven ones but the, the mechanically driven ones uh, tend to be superior for any kind of reasonable bioprinting um, because of their ability to retract back and stop extrusion um, very precisely uh, you know, over and over and over and over, you know, hundreds to maybe a thousand times in a print. Mm -hmm. And we basically wanted to make sure we could do that with every printer we were going to use. And we also had a huge growing need for printers. The nice thing is that 3D printers were becoming available left and right. Um, they were coming down in cost, like the PrinterBot Simple Metal you're familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, was I think at most $600. I could have that wrong. Um, but the, whereas the MakerBot, when we originally got it, was, I think, over $2,000. So they were just plummeting in price. So we kept getting more of them, modifying them. And since they all accepted G-code, which we were generating from softwares like Slicer Cura and uh, Kiss Slicer and various packages like that, uh, we were able to do the same prints on all the printers. They didn't behave differently from one another. 
we were all, I was able to teach a lot of people, including yourself, to use one software or two software packages and enable you to use four or five printers mm -hmm. as opposed to being limited to a single machine. So the printer that we used for the heart print was a Flash Forge, which is just a MakerBot uh, clone, essentially, um, that we took the motherboard out of and just replaced it with a Duet Wi-Fi, which is a very popular kind of high-performance 3D printer motherboard that you can find right now. And we replaced the plastic extruder on that printer with a Replistruder syringe pump. I think it was the Replistruder version 3, which is one of the designs that I made. Right. And then we, in that syringe pump, we had a 10 milliliter Hamilton gas tight syringe. And on that, we had a 25 gauge needle, I think. Um, it may have been a, uh, like a custom needle, just a, uh, a big fat needle, where we take a smaller needle and kind of epoxy it in the end mm -hmm. to make us a really long needle that doesn't deflect. So. And you, you mentioned, you kind of touched upon it a little briefly, I think, to try and make this uh a little easier to say like a, a graduate student who's just starting to get into bioprinting or 3D yeah. printing in general. You mentioned retraction. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that? Because that is immensely yes. important and, and what systems can and cannot do that very well and why? Of course. When you are extruding a viscous fluid or a paste or just a bio ink out of a small needle, most needles are small, um, it's tough. And oftentimes you press really hard on that fluid in the syringe and it kind of just slowly comes out of the needle. And uh, I'd say about 90% of the examples of bioprinting I've seen where they were doing this, there were bubbles in the syringe. And what happens is, is if you press on the ink with the bubbles in it, the bubbles compress and they store energy like a spring. And the ink just kind of like slowly comes out of the nozzle. When you remove pressure from the back of the syringe, if it's an air pressure driven extruder, the bubbles can keep that pressure stored like a spring, right? And they can continue to make ink ooze. And so pneumatic extruders that just vent their pressure to atmosphere and stop extrusion, oftentimes kind of ooze or they leak, as, especially if they're moving from one area where they're extruding to another. They might leave like a little dribble or drool or something between them the spots. A mechanical extruder is capable of pulling the piston backwards. And I know it's possible with pneumatic extruders to put a vacuum, but very few do it. Right. I actually haven't seen, I think, more than one of all the bioprinters that's capable of doing it, and it's hard to tune. Yeah. Back to mechanical design. Mechanical design is capable of pulling the plunger back, which can pull on the ink and if it has bubbles, the bubbles, and basically exert a negative or a decreased pressure mm -hmm. on this material. That can stop extrusion. And when you're doing small details in a print, going back and forth, printing little bits at a time, little islands, yep. you don't want to leak a lot between those islands. And you also don't want to leak on the islands because it, it'll screw the, the, the actual printing path there up. And so you want to be able to stop extrusion, and that's why you need retraction. And retraction really works well on mechani mechanical extruders. Not all mechanical extruders. You have to design these mechanical extruders well. Like a syringe pump is actually a very poor, when I say syringe pump, I mean like an infusion style syringe pump where, you know, it's sitting on the table. Yeah, it's for like CT injection. sitting on top of it. Yeah. What? It's like for a CT it's, contrast injection or something like that where it's just exactly, direct. Exactly, like medical. Pushes down on a plunger and that's pump. it. Um, exactly. And, Those and, are not designed well for this. Right. Um, I think a, a way that I really like to uh, have people envision retraction who are just getting into 3D printing is if you've ever used a hot glue gun, for example, when you're doing arts and crafts <laughs> in kindergarten, and you put a little bit of hot glue gun, or uh, the hot glue over here, and then the second that you lift up that hot glue gun, there's always that, like, that silken thread, kind of almost like spider silk that gets pulled off the tip. Um, that's basically what you do not want in a 3D print. And a way that you can effectively, as you're saying, avoid that is if right when you're done squeezing the hot glue gun, if you were to pull back on that glue stick a little bit, you would return material back up into the nozzle so you wouldn't get that stringing. Exactly. And when you're doing hundreds or tens of thousands, depending on your print, of these travel paths from A to B 
um, to see. And if you're having that little amount of, of string between them, you're really basically contaminating your print with material that shouldn't be there. And in the, going forward with bioprinting in general, if you're trying to print tiny, tiny tunnel networks, basically like vasculature system, you can't really afford to have stuff inside those tubes or anything else. Like you just don't want exactly. anything other than what the computer has calculated from your model, um, which is why I think our lab really likes using mechanically driven extruders. And you can get nice pneumatic ones, but they cost so much. They add a compressor and weight to your printer and they add noise. And they also are not consistent throughout the entire volume of a syringe. So mm -hmm. as you go from a full syringe to a, to a nearly empty syringe, if you're driving it with the same pressure, you'll actually get different flow rates out the nozzle. Right. Uh, whereas a mechanical syringe pump extruder relies on a direct displacement principle. Yes. Or direct drive positive displacement principle. And also for those that are interested, this concept of avoiding these hairs, these, these oozing bits, in 3D printing, desktop 3D printing, or thermoplastic 3D printing, this is generally just called stringing. And on those desktop 3D printers, stringing is avoided with retraction. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think what you're, you're going off there with desktop 3D printers is when, when anyone joins our lab or anyone trying to get into yeah. 3D bioprinting, we do not recommend anyone just starts bioprinting. Back when I was educating you guys mm -hmm. at the very beginning, um, actually you were one of the only people I ever taught that had any sort of bioprinting background. You came in without plastic 3D printing. Yeah. You knew bioprinting from a lab you worked in. Mm -hmm. It was, I, I had every single person that came in do plastic printing first because the principles of plastic printing apply directly to most of the printing we do. There are just some strange settings that you change, like the filament for, is just the syringe instead, but to your point, right. whenever we have anyone join our lab, we basically try and put them through a plastic printing boot camp. Right. And anyone trying to get into bioprinting, that is a really nice way to learn a lot of really fundamental skills that will translate almost perfectly to bioprinting. Number one would be CAD experience of learning how to make parts. Because even if you don't get into bioprinting, learning how to 3D print plastic parts for your research, it's, it's beyond mandatory. <laughs> in my head, where I really can't think of anyone in our lab who, who has a physical lab space who should not have a 3D printer. If you're a mathematics professor and you're just writing on a whiteboard all day, by all means. But anyone with a physical lab space nowadays really should have a plastic printer to print all these, we, we say the word jig so many times in lab, it's, it's kind of a joke now. Um, so I think yes. what, what, what is occasionally a little intimidating for someone who comes from, say, you were a biology major in undergrad and you're getting a PhD either in biomedical engineering or something similar, is CAD can seem a little intimidating, but that's fine. I think the, the amount of value that it can offer for anyone who's in a lab is so immense is to just give it a little bit of a try, where if you're a student, you can get Autodesk Inventor with a student email um, it's a fantastic piece of software. Uh, I can't really recommend it enough. It's, it's very crucial. And there, there are plenty of other packages out there like SolidWorks that people like you to use. I've used that. I know you have. Um, but, but don't just let, if, you're, if your project is something like cell culture and, and other types of testing, don't, don't think that you don't need 3D printing because if, if you have that tool in your belt, you'll actually start thinking a little differently about how you make your experiments. I, I, I would like to point out one thing. Uh, when you're learning stuff in a lab and your goal is to become good at bioprinting, let's say your professor has a 3D printer. If you learn 3D printing on the 3D printer, it's kind of fun. I mean, a lot of people find it really fun. It's a hobby for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but you can actually see what's happening there. And it's a lot more tactile. You can grab the print, look at what's screwed up or what's really great about it. Yeah. And it's a much better way of learning. It's very hands-on. Um, and it's, I think it's far faster to learn through that than it is to learn on a bioprinter. Yeah. Or any of these other things in biological research where you're dealing with antibodies and you, these are all below the length scale of what you can see. At least with 3D printing, you can just stare at it for a good 10, 15 minutes uh, and see what's <laughs> going on. Um, but, but back to the, the printers, why, why didn't you want to use some of the commercially available ones? I know that there are pretty popular companies out there 
Um, and an Envision tech, for example, was has been available for a really long time. Um, so, what what is the reasoning for trying to do more of this custom stuff? Um, and should should someone who's trying to learn how to do this paper think, oh, it's it's a custom printer, therefore this is just a technology solely limited to this lab who's developed it? We had a need for control over things. We needed a system that allowed us to get deeply under the hood and change settings that I think are not allowed on most bioprinting platforms out there. Um, we, re we recognize that some of the bioprinting platforms out there have a syringe, they have an XYZ system, and they can move around to the, in the same size and shape as a lot of the printers that we modified and use. But those printers tend to be wa walled gardens with kind of not the greatest garden inside those walls. Um, because our modified designs are basically just desktop 3D printers that rely on open source software, that's not terrible. Like pretty decent open source software as far as open source software We've goes. We've clearly been able to get some, some work done. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, when we fresh print, it's a lot like plastic printing. Uh, just as an example, if you've ever heard of Prusa Slicer or Cura or Slicer or Kiss Slicer or Simplify 3D, we use all the, all of them. Or we did in the lab. I, I still do now at Fluid Form. Um, it's very straightforward for me to go in and change any setting I want. I have some a tiny bit of experience that suggests very strongly that using commercial bioprinters is a, at least right now, maybe with the exception of, let's say, the LOLs bot bioprinter, right now it seems to be kind of a crippling experience where I'm not able to do hardly anything. And I know that those bioprinters are designed to help people get started with bioprinting, but they tend to not provide a runway for takeoff. They just get you moving in a very simple direction. Mm -hmm. And we had advanced needs, and I think most people are going to have advanced needs in the short-term future, so I hope that changes with the bioprinters. Right. Um, so you did talk about the, the software a little bit, how I think what would be, if, if I was a, a new incoming student, what would be the, the first one that you would have me just try and learn? Um, what would be like your number one recommendation as a balance for plastic and or bio? <laughs> this is a good question. Um, I think I would always suggest getting a very well liked plastic desktop 3D printer and using the software that's recommended with it. Currently the crowd favorite is the Prusa i3 or the not the prusa mini as much but the prusa i3 um, i think it's the mk3s right now and prusa slicer is pretty good slicer plus plus which is like the current development edition of slicer works really well with it too um i've used cura with it i think prusa slicer is an excellent place to start it in and of itself is a little bit of a walled garden, but each of these softwares, it kind of tries to be that, tries to help guide you through the initial starting points. Yeah. But it's very capable. I could have done every single one of the prints on the collagen paper with Prusa Slicer alone. So. Yeah. Um, so about going back to the, the heart that you were printing, um, something that seemed to be pretty pervasive in the science paper was pretty much using the same ink. For oh, yeah. Almost the entire thing. And if you can talk about um, which ink and why, um, and really why it's so important to use fresh in the first place to do that. Yeah. And I, it's so awkward to promote fresh because I'm an inventor. <laughs> um, but I didn't invent fresh to be famous or to promote myself in any way. I invented fresh to help bioprinting. Um, and I do think it's important to use fresh for most gelling inks. The ink we relied on was a Tilo collagen provided by Advanced Biomatrix. Um, at the time, Advanced Biomatrix was kind of the, the, the standout company that was offering collagen inks. I remember approaching them at a conference and talking to them a lot. And I had been looking for a good collagen material. I'd used rat tail collagen from BD, and I'd used some 
kind of self-made rat tail collagen and some decellularized DCM, major gels. All these things have collagens, not necessarily collagen one and major gel, but um, Advanced Biomatrix was hell-bent on providing a very pure, very high-quality telo collagen ink. And telo collagen, for those that don't know, is just a, it forms a little bit of a stronger gel than a telo collagen, if you can get a telo collagen to gel in the first place. But telo collagen is, is what we think of when we're talking about rat tail or bovine collagen, oftentimes we're talking about telo collagen. So their Life Ink series of inks, their Life Ink 240 now is kind of, is basically the equivalent to what we use in the collagen paper. Um, it's a, in the paper we were using, I think it was a 24 mg per mil collagen in a 0.04 molar acetic acid. It's been a little while. 0.24? Uh, huh? I think it was 0.24. 0.24, thank you. <laughs> uh, acetic acid, fresh, is really the only technology that exists that supports collagen printing really well. Um, your, I, I think your description, honestly, of fresh is the best. The idea of just using, a, it's like drawing in wet sand, kind of. Um, but basically, you can't print a mound of collagen ink and expect it to maintain its shape. You need something to support it and hold it in place. You could try printing supports one by one, but it's far easier to just stick a needle down into a material that moves out of the way and captures your ink while simultaneously encouraging it to gel. On the topic of just like ink formulations, a lot of people use methac related things. Um, I think a really important thing to highlight in this paper is we really, I don't think we had to use it for anything. We, we do show that you can uh, print a little bit of methacrylated hyaluronic acid uh, pretty shallow into the bath, but we really didn't use methacrylated anything in the paper. And I think when someone is going through all the literature and they're reading paper after paper, they're seeing that commonality, that thread between everyone using methacrylated stuff. Gelma, Hama, Gelma, yeah, uh, Hama Pegda, yeah, yeah, different alginates. Um, and I think what, what you were really getting at was um, Fresh not only ubiquitously supports your ink, there's no longer, like, normally if you're printing and you have supports, you have strut A and strut B, and there can even be still a little bit, technically, of, of deformation between those struts as you're spanning them. Uh, you have to actually have the time and material to lay down the support material in the first place, what immensely helps with fresh is that you're printing into that material from the beginning, so it's already there ahead of time. You don't ever have to print support material. Removing the print is very easy and gentle. It's just heating. Yep. There's no snapping. Like I mean, you and I, we've printed plenty of plastic parts. When, when you're removing some supports, you can really easily have little burrs left over on the plastic. It's a little bit stressful when you're trying to snap these things off. We, we don't ever have that in Fresh, which is really, really nice, especially when you're dealing with a high value cellularized part. Um, yes. You really don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, it's, it's extremely gentle, so. It's, it's gentle with chemistry too. Yes. It, it's gelatin based, mm -hmm. which ha, it has been a staple of cell culture for a really long time. And you get to choose the buffer that you want to use. I mean, if you're printing collagen, anything that can neutralize a weak acid will work. Right. Uh, we like heapies uh, just because of the results that we've had with it. Um, but 10x PBS, I mean, that's a bit much, but 1x will do. Uh, there's a, just a lot of the goods buffers uh, in the relatively around the pH 7 range will work really well. Mm -hmm. So it's it, cells love it because they're basically going into if you if you if you make life support or the slurry and fresh with cell culture media, I mean, you really can't draw much of a difference between that support medium and just cell culture medium that's had gelatin added to it. So the cells don't care. Like it's, it's really similar to just printing into straight up cell culture media. If you're doing cell prints, if you're doing collagen, it's, it's into gelatin with a little bit of a buffer in it. So. 
So say I were, again, I, I, I'll always try and use the example of like a, a, a new first year graduate student being put on a project because I think that's a really good mindset to be in whenever you're trying to explain something and, and hopefully someone's watching this thinking, yes, please continue to ask questions with that frame of mind. Um, <laughs> is what, if, I, if my advisor was telling me to try and print something like the heart today, what things in terms of software settings would be important, like the crucial ones? Um, oh. And you briefly mentioned the the needle, um, but I, I wouldn't uh, glance over it because it's actually a really important aspect of printing large things is talking about um, different needles or, or altering them. Um, and then just the, the general process that you were going through and iterating to get this thing to actually work. This is a great question. Um, if I had to communicate really quickly, like the, some important settings, I'd say you could start with just not trying to print too fast or too slow. So I'd say like 15 or 20 millimeters a second. Uh, I'd say use a 25 gauge needle. So it'll look really good, but it'll also not take very long. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go much smaller with fresh and we tend to, and that's why I'm saying it doesn't take very long because a lot of the prints we do are much higher resolution. And then for retraction, if you're using a Replistruder 3 or a Replistruder 4 or anything newer, um, you're talking about 0.075 millimeters of retraction, roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a little bit more on a 10 ml uh, Hamilton gas type. For, I'd say two, I'd say two perimeters, yeah, and then 20% rectilinear infill with about 20% overlap between the infill and the perimeters. That's that kind of summarizes it. And I think uh, another another part of my question was going into. I know it's it's in the methods, but it's a great example of what we're trying to have this series do is. Um, when you're going through the methods, there's not a particular line of text that is bold to emphasize. This was actually a lot harder than just the sentence as it reads. Um, yeah. And that one is another one that like really is crucial to the success of whatever you're doing. And in that case, I think reinforcing this needle was something that you were experimenting with. Um, when you just read it in a paper and it says it was reinforced with a whatever external shaft to prevent deflection. Moving Would you on. like me to talk about some of these details, like what, like, kind of the challenges associated with this stuff? Yeah, um, like what, what was your methodology for trying to reinforce a needle, for instance, to prevent um, deflection? And then once you got it going, how, how long did it actually take these things to print? So to make a reinforced needle, all I did was I got a, I think it was a 22 gauge needle. Um, you can actually use a hypodermic needle, it doesn't matter if if it's sharp or blunt on the end. And then you take a smaller needle, like a 25 gauge, and you, I th I'm not sure if a 25 gauge fits inside a 22, but I think it does. Um, you take a 25 gauge short needle, not an inch, not two inches, but like a, a half inch, and you pull it out of its hub, you remove the epoxy on it, and then you re-epoxy it into the end of the 22 gauge needle. So now you've got a 22 gauge needle and at the very tip you've got a 25 sticking out of it. Mm -hmm. And the 22 is very stiff. You can actually get them insanely stiff. Um, but the 25 is pretty easy to bend, but mm -hmm. because it's so short, it's not gonna bend as much. Right. And the reason this is important is because when you're doing fresh printing, you're sticking a needle down into a medium. That's It's kind of like a paste. And so as you're pushing the needle through it, there's a force on the needle and if the needle is too long and too skinny, it'll bend or deflect. And you want it to be stiff enough to be able to push aside the support material and you know stay relatively straight throughout printing. But it really is as simple as just epoxy on a tiny needle to the end of a, of a fatter needle. And try and be conservative with your epoxy. You don't want a big blob of epoxy down there. You want just, just enough to make an adhesion between the two needles and seal them. Um, if somebody's going to try and do that, my suggestion is to take the little needle and take a paintbrush with epoxy and just put a little dab, stick it in the bigger needle and rotate it while pushing it in. And that'll deposit, that'll move the epoxy around, form a seal. Mm -hmm. And as you're pushing it in, it'll allow it to get down in there and really secure the tube. I don't know if it was you. I think I've seen them around um, lab. A great example, again, of how you can use 3D printing is you can almost make a little rig that oh, one yeah. holds the the large needle in place and the other one, the smaller needle, and you can very, you basically have them perfectly coaxial and you just very slowly right. move them together. And then you just let them sit there for a day, let them dry. 
Um, I think that's, a, again, a great example of, hey, I know how to 3D print this. I'm not just going to do it by hand and hold it here for 45 minutes. I'm just going to print it and walk away. That's true. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, you mentioned it at the very start of, uh, of the video that um, this is a heart model. So this was not done in a hood, which is really nice. I, I find whenever you anything sterile, it takes 10 times longer. Yeah, I, you know, I apologize. I forgot to answer how long this took. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it took some time less than 10 hours, uh, somewhere around six or seven hours. It's been a long time since I printed that heart. Um, but that's approximately right. And we could probably do it in a lot less time, mm -hmm. but at, at the time we were being very careful. Uh, and we could also spend a lot more time if we wanted to print it at five millimeters a second. I'm sure it would have taken at least a day. So, yeah. So after the print is done, um, yeah. and it's, what is basically, how do I go from the printer has now beeped that it's done to getting something that is ready to be photographed? Yeah. So, your fresh print has finished, and you've got a heart made out of collagen stuck inside this paste, and you need to get it out. What you do is you take the container with the paste and the print stuck in it, and you put it in an incubator, um, or honestly on a dry bath, just something to warm it up. And don't microwave it, because collagen is very sensitive to overheating. Just warm it up gently, give it time. If you put it, if it's in open air, but it's on a dry bath, put some insulation over it, like a styrofoam box or something. Um, once that's molten, completely molten, I'm not talking about like thick and chunky, but like 100% molten, no doubt about it, the gelatin is transparent, you can see the print. Then you can very gently aspirate the gelatin out, replace it with PBS. Aspirate the gelatin out, replace it with PBS or heapies or whatever buffer solution you chose to make your support material with. And honestly, it's just being patient and cycling out the gelatin for a buffer. Um, that process, depending on the size of your print, can take a while because you have to heat up this body of gelatin and get it completely molten. Gelatin can kind of be slow to melt sometimes. Yeah. Um, but if it's a small print, like in a little petri dish, 15 minutes. You walk, you walk away, come back, and it's molten, and you're ready to exchange the fluid with some washing buffer. And I think you you touched upon it there, but I think something that I would definitely emphasize is gently heating, because there have been yes. plenty of times where it's you know it's 5:30, your print just finished, you really want to go home and you want to eat and work out or something, and you're like, I'll just turn this hot plate up to 70 C, and I'll be done. This is like saying, oh, if it takes an hour to bake at 350, it'll take 30 minutes at 700 degrees. Therefore, it'll be better. I've found that if you ramp up the temperature too much, it does obviously melt the gelatin, but I think a slow release really helps a more mature collagen network in the, in the case of collagen form. And I've seen it where if you heat it really quickly, you almost get a nearly invisible print because I think the, the collagen really isn't that matured. Um, but something that you, you mentioned in the beginning, the importance of getting air out of the syringe and that because the air bubbles act as a dampening agent, they uh, minimize the accuracy of your force for extrusion, which yeah. is when you're dealing with the amount of like fire hose effect, like that cross-sectional area reduction, you need to be as precise as possible with your force. But what about getting air out of the bath? Well, this is a really good question. Um, one you're very experienced with dealing, dealing with. So the best way to get air out of a bath, in my opinion, is to avoid getting air into the bath in the first place. But if you have a bath with a big air bubble in it, there's a couple ways you can deal with it. You can take a empty syringe, put a long needle on it, and stick it down in there and pull the air out. And the bath will collapse down and voila, no more big bubble. If you have a lot of bubbles, that's harder to deal with. There's not a really elegant solution to that. That's why it's important to be very careful in getting fresh support materials into a container without introducing a bunch of air in the process. Yeah. Um, I know people like to use a spatula to scoop it down into a container. I've always been on the other side where instead of using a spatula, I actually tap the container support down onto a table until I've got most of it down near the, the lip. And then I just very carefully tap really hard and get it to dislodge and come down into my dish. Mm -hmm. One big lump without bubbles and have it spread out. 
the other thing is if you want it to fill your dish and you've got like a bunch of lumps stacked on top of each other, you could use a spatula to smooth it out. Or you could just take your dish and tap it on a surface. Right. It's a big in plastic. It's sensitive to shock, which will make it yield and flow like a fluid. So you shock it by dropping it repeatedly on a table. If it's a glass dish, don't do this on a metal surface. <laughs> do it on a lab notebook or something like that. Well, I think what, what we found just through years of experimentation was that it was best to either uh, tap a print container on styrofoam, like a, like maybe, I mean, you probably have a styrofoam yeah. cooler yeah. somewhere in lab, or a lab notebook. Those were the two materials that we found were the best. Lab notebooks, man. They're, yeah. they're the black, cheap, come in a big box. You know, they say like lab notebook and mm-hmm. gold lettering, like those things. You just tap a container, rotate it a little bit each time, you yeah. know. It must be Works like the, the deceleration or something of, of the, the bath as opposed yeah, to hitting a, a hard water. lab table. It must be a little bit different, but <laughs> styrofoam and lab notebooks work really well. And then uh, I think another thing that we've never really had to do, but if, if you have the means to do it, you can definitely try and re-centrifuge the container because some, some centrifuges yes. come with adapters that let you put in, say, a six-well plate. Um, that that is obviously more limited to whatever centrifuge you have, but I know that there are ones um, that you can pot- like potentially do that with. Um, yeah. So that's always like a, a last case uh, scenario where I, I think instead of like two thousand G for five minutes is normally what we're doing to compress the bath. I think to get air bubbles out, three thousand G I think for thirty seconds is is enough because you just need enough to you need enough force to have it yield and flow again, but you don't yeah. need to be there all day. So um, that's also what we recommend for degassing syringes, right, is um, you can find a way. We, we have adapters, again, why you should have a 3D printer in the lab. And we, I think we've already shared the adapters that let you put a syringe in your centrifuge and have it basically fit as if it were a 50 ml conical tube that is normally centrifuge all the time. We, we make adapters for those, and, and so should people if they're trying to get bubbles out. Um, but that's how we remove bubbles from the ink. Uh, and then another factor was when an ink goes from being refrigerated to room temperature, you can have it warm up, and in the act of warming up, it nucleates bubbles, which is something that, that we've we found as well. So um, all those things, like it just a little bit of experience, but hopefully um, if you just let your ink slowly come up to room temperature, and then you, you centrifuge that, you carefully transfer your bath, zero air bubbles, you'll get a beautiful print. You are the slurry king. <laughs> you will always be the slurry king, man. <laughs> yeah. Could have said it better myself. In terms of, of getting the actual file for the heart, I think that's almost always been a pain, at least to go from, say, CT data, as you were saying before, to an STL to print. Has any of that gotten better and easier, to your knowledge? Uh. <laughs> if it, please tell me no <laughs> or yes, but... Um, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's a little bit of an art. There are people who are paid a lot of money to do this kind of thing. Um, there in ho- in many hospitals, you know, there are people who literally just process this kind of data into 3d prints that can then be used for surgical modeling. Yep. Um, I by no means am skilled at this technique, but I did my best to try and do a little bit of that for like a, uh, an MRI scan of a brain. Um, beyond that, I haven't done much. It, I would say it's pretty difficult. But if you have training from somebody who knows what they're doing, I'm sure it's a lot easier. Um, I never had that opportunity, but yeah. Excellent. Well, I don't think I have any more questions. I don't know if there's anything you want to want to close on in particular. If not, totally fine. Uh, you know, I think I think it's important to mention that there were multiple hearts that this wasn't. The heart in this paper was not the only heart mm-hmm. we did. I It was the seventh iteration of slicing settings for printing a full heart. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I never really did a full heart before it. I did parts of hearts because I could tell very quickly by watching the printer what was going wrong. Um, once we fired it off and let it go, it turned out great. And that's wonderful. Uh, oftentimes, it's a little bit more difficult than that. Um, I gotta say, this was not done in a bio hood, even though we call it bioprinting, right? It was done on a lab bench in an open shared lab space. Um, I definitely put like a sheet over it, being like, "Don't touch when the heart is printing." Um, Didn't you I have did. a power failure? Wasn't yeah. that how? Well, yes. 
It was a That's happy right. coincidence where that occasionally happens, where we actually got really nice stuff from that. Yeah, uh, there's a picture showing um, inner details of the heart. Mm -hmm. Obviously, photograph, not CT or anything like that. And what that was was a full heart print that was going and going fine, I might add. And uh, the power went out. Yeah. So we were left with kind of like a bottom piece of near yeah. the apex of the heart. And I think uh, I think it was Dan uh, Shawarski who when you were about to just toss that because it wasn't oh, a full heart, and he yeah. says, "No, there's there's beauty in that. This is great. We can prove a yeah, lot. Yeah, can take pictures of this, and it ended up being really important. Yeah, I was like, ah, this is not the full heart. It's worthless. <laughs> um, um, but I, I like how you're talking about how that heart was not the first; it was the seventh. I think something that. Uh, is kind of underemphasized in any research paper, not not just this one that we're discussing, is how much failure has to go in before you actually get an image that goes into a paper. And there's plenty of work that doesn't even make it into a publication or into a paper period, but there, there were plenty of failures in almost every possible figure panel of this paper. I can speak with that uh, with a degree of certainty there. Um, but I think that's something in, in science in general that really needs to be re-emphasized is there's a lot of failure and that's okay and that's how you get to something that actually looks really nice and works but um, yeah. any any student um, especially in a graduate level uh, needs to understand that it's absolutely okay to fail and I'd say it's necessary in order to make you a little more resilient uh, of a researcher so I, I think I've failed so often <laughs> Uh, at prints uh, that the way I view it now is just that failure is is literally part of success like there's it's not distinct mm -hmm. um, it's so much so that when I was printing the heart that's in the paper uh, I didn't even stick around I just went home because I knew it was going to take a while yeah. and there's nothing I can do except sit there and obsess and like worry about it the entire time and there's no point in doing that um, it's good if you're watching a plastic print and you're not used to plastic printing to sit there and observe what's happening and if it fails it fails and you see it at this point when you're really experienced with this stuff you kind of grow a little bit nonchalant and you understand that there's a chance something might go wrong but you're just going to have to be patient to find out so yeah yeah i'd say also that this the six hours on this print is not the longest print we've done uh we've done something probably closer to 13 hours um but I, I know this print is attractive for a number of reasons because it's a full heart. Um, at the end of the day, I just want to reiterate that like a lot of people worked on this and it's still not a full beating human heart. We have a long way to go for that. Yeah. And I, I like to think of the paper as showing kind of building blocks of the heart. Um, if I had to, if I had to provide a little bit, bit of advice on doing bioprinting, if I could say one or two things, <laughs> I would say, watch out for bubbles. They are they're deaf? They they'll just ruin uh, a good print because a bubble will come out like when it's supposed to be extruding ink or something, or there'll be a bubble in your support material, and that's just a void, and you'll print like goo into a void, and yep. you know, it looks dumb. Um, but also like, don't be afraid to change settings and screw up. So watch out for bubbles and take some risks and uh, iterate. But that's it. Great. All yeah. right, well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you have a good one. And I know that there's a lot more research to be done uh, at Fluid Forum, but I'm not sure how much of that you can talk about right now. Uh, I wish I could talk a lot. <laughs> there's so much I wish I could talk about, but yeah. Thanks, dude. Yeah. This was pleasant, yeah. Absolutely, all right, thank you so much. Yep, see you. Take care. Thanks for watching this research highlight. We hope you found it insightful. If you have any more additional questions for the author, please be sure to leave them in the comment section below. While you're there, if you don't mind giving it a thumbs up to help more researchers find content like this. Thanks.